Hello everyone. Welcome to the latest Facebook Live on brain tumor research and treatment hosted by the National Cancer Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health. My name is David Ahrens, CEO of National Brain Tumor Society, and I will be today's moderator. Today I am pleased to be joined by two world-renowned experts in the field of brain tumors, Dr. Mark Gilbert and Dr. Terry Armstrong of the National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, and the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Strokes, Neuro-Oncology Branch. Neuro-Oncology Branch is a very special place for the brain tumor community, offering many great resources and opportunities. You're going to hear a lot more about the Neuro-Oncology Branch today. Now let me introduce, and I'm pleased to, to, for Dr. Gilbert and Dr. Armstrong to say a bit more about themselves before we get started. Dr. Gilbert? Thank you, David. Um, thanks so much for participating with us today. My name is Mark Gilbert. Uh, I'm a neuro-oncologist and have been active in the field of uh, brain cancer research for over three decades. Um, I am currently the chief of the neuro-oncology branch, as you mentioned, part of the NCI and NINDS here at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Hi everybody, I'm Terry Armstrong. I'm a nurse practitioner and I head the outcome section in the neuro-oncology branch where we're trying to understand the impact of the disease on the patient and their families. I've been working with patients with brain tumors for the last 26 years and I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Armstrong. And as many of you know, May is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. And actually the United States Senate just reaffirmed that it is Brain Tumor Awareness Month on a unanimous basis last evening. And so in honor of that, we are discussing current and future adult primary and spine tumor treatment and research today, and a new program organized by the Neuro-Oncology Branch focused on the care of patients with very rare central nervous system, or CNS, tumors. I welcome you to what promises to be a very interesting discussion. In conjunction with the topics that will be discussed in this broadcast, we encourage you to ask questions about adult primary brain and spine tumor research and treatment in the comments of this video. We ask that you keep your questions and comments to today's topic. If we do not get to your questions during the event, we will answer them as soon as possible in the comments. As a reminder, we cannot answer questions about your treatment publicly or specific treatment issues pertaining to you in this, in, in this setting. Please talk about these questions with your treating physician. Additionally, if you have further questions, you can contact the NCI Contact Center at 1-800-4-CANCER or by visiting cancer.gov forward slash contact for live chat help. Okay, let's get started. So Dr. Gilbert, can you give us an overview of what brain cancer is and who it affects? Sure, thank you, David. So it's very important that we realize that, as you mentioned, the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and we think of brain tumors in really two categories, those we consider primary, where the cancer arises out of the brain or spinal cord, and those that are secondary or metastatic, meaning they've spread from cancers in other parts of the body, commonly lung cancer and breast cancer, among others. So brain tumors, the primary brain tumors in particular, are considered rare. Uh, we estimate approximately 25,000 adults are diagnosed each year in the United States. Um, and amongst them, some are very rare. And as we will talk about later, there are over 100 different types of primary brain tumors. Primary brain tumors are actually less than 2% of all cancers diagnosed. And according to the FDA and other regulatory organizations, both in the United States and Europe, any disease that occurs in less than 200,000 people are considered rare. Um, but some tumors are even more rare, and we'll talk about those later, as Dr. Gilbert said. Thank you, doctors. Um, and we know that they're rare, but we also know they're, they're, um, they present very serious um, conditions for patients. Can you tell us a bit more about the symptoms, diagnosis, and standard treatments for brain cancer, and what a patient might expect? Sure, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about the symptoms that patients experience. It's not uncommon for patients to present very suddenly. And in fact, 
it's estimated almost half of patients actually present to an emergency room with a sudden change or symptom that happens. And about 20% of patients, that could be a seizure, but other things can occur, including headaches, and then symptoms that are related directly to where the tumor is within the central nervous system. It could be things like weakness or difficulty talking or even difficulty with memory. These symptoms are critically important in alerting the patient that something's wrong and that medical care is needed. And sometimes the symptoms help us in defining what's really happening with the person. So once a person has a symptom, um, it, it often leads to a diagnostic test. Commonly, a brain CAT scan or MRI is performed, which will show that there is an abnormality in the brain. Uh, the patients will then undergo a neurosurgical procedure, and that procedure is incredibly important for making an accurate diagnosis. And that diagnosis um, should be reviewed by an expert in, in neuropathology. Uh, certainly, a misdiagnosis can result in uh, the, an incorrect treatment plan. So once a diagnosis is confirmed, um, we would advise that uh, patients seek out expert help, and that's typically uh, by a neuro-oncologist. Um, and it is certainly uh, worthwhile asking the doctor what their experience is and, and how many patients they've treated um, so that you get the optimal care. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. So as we think about... Oh, keep going. Please keep going, Dr. Gilbert. <laughs> sure. So I, I, I just wanted to point out again that there are more than 100 types of brain cancer. So you can see how important it is that an accurate diagnosis is, is made. Um, and then the subsequent treatment is really dependent upon the type of brain cancer. But it typically includes surgery. And for most of these cancers, the more tumor that can be safely taken out during surgery, the, the better the patient will do, often followed by radiation and chemotherapy, and increasingly we are looking at immunotherapy as a potential treatment option. So the, the other point that we will talk about in greater detail um, is that of involvement in clinical trials and the importance in clinical trials in advancing our knowledge and helping us to develop better and better treatments uh, for patients uh, with brain tumors. As Dr. Gilbert mentioned, it's really important to get that expert opinion, and a neuro-oncologist is somebody who has been specially trained in the care and treatment of patients with brain tumors. It's really important to get that expert opinion and an opportunity for second opinions at the time of diagnosis or during your treatment if there's treatment decisions to be made. Thank you, and just, just so we all uh, can understand um, what we're talking about here, are all brain tumors considered to be brain cancer? So that's a great question. Um, and so when we look at the, at the tumor, uh, we use a classification system that has been developed by the World Health Organization, which, put, which puts brain tumors in a class ranging from uh, grade one to grade four. Grade one tumors are considered benign and can be cured with complete removal, whereas grades two, three, and four are considered malignant. The higher the number, the more malignant cancers. Importantly to that, unlike other cancers, which oftentimes they look at if the lymph nodes or other parts of the body are involved, most primary brain tumors stay within the central nervous system. So this grading system that Dr. Gilbert talked about is really important in defining how we uh, treat patients with those cancers. Thank you. And another question that often comes up is you mentioned there's secondary brain cancer is cancer that starts in one part of the body and then moves to the brain. So let me ask the opposite. Do primary brain tumors that start in the brain ever move to other parts of the body? So it is quite unusual for most primary brain tumors to leave the central nervous system. Um, and I would say that the, the likelihood, particularly in diseases like glioblastoma, which is the grade four glioma, it's less than one in a thousand. So it is so uncommon that we don't actually do surveillance uh, as you would do in, in systemic cancers like lung and breast cancer. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, now that we understand a bit more about that there are many types of brain tumors uh, and different types of treatment, let's move to um, brain tumor treatment and then pivot to research. So if you're just joining us, 
We're talking with Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Armstrong about brain tumor research, treatment and research. You can ask questions in the comments and we'll get to as many as possible at the end. Now let's talk about survivorship and the quality of life that patients have during and after treatment. Dr. Armstrong, what is that like? Are we improving survivorship and quality of life for patients today? It's a great question, David, and something that, that we're really focused on here within the neuro-oncology branch, as well as your group and others around the country and around the world. We know that the impact on patients can be great. It's estimated that over 50% of low and high-grade tumor patients have difficulty even returning to work from the time of diagnosis. We know the symptoms that I talked about can occur at the time of diagnosis, but some can also occur throughout the, the time the person is dealing with the illness, and that can be difficult. In addition to people like us focusing on understanding what that impact is and trying to improve it, there's a real understanding of that within understanding the impact of our treatments. So the FDA has identified that they really are interested in how treatments make the patient feel and function. And within our clinical trials, we try to identify that and monitor that for patients throughout the trial. So we really understand what the impact is that we're getting. In addition, there's a real emphasis and knowledge that there are people out there living with the diagnosis of brain tumors. And the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States has reported recently that it's estimated over 700,000 people in the U.S. are living with the diagnosis of a primary brain tumor. So we have to identify those issues and that they face, including care issues, financial issues that they may face, and then impact on the extended family. Um, the Society of Neuro-Oncology has developed a survivorship care plan, which is a nice guide for physicians outside the field of neuro-oncology to know how to help patients cope with their illness and deal with the issues they may face as a result of it. Thank you. It sounds like there are a lot of efforts going on to try to improve uh, the care and quality of life uh, for patients. And as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Gilbert and Dr. Armstrong, there are many different types of brain tumors. And among them, although all brain tumors are considered rare, there are some especially rare CNS tumors. And so um, what are some of those especially rare CNS tumors and what efforts are being done to to address those those rare tumors. Um, maybe you could start with how do we define a rare central nervous system or CNS tumor? That's a great question. If we look at the definition of rare diseases used by the NIH and other organizations, um, in general, those are any diseases that occur in less than 200,000 people per year. So all primary brain tumors could be considered rare. Within the over 130 different types of primary brain tumors, there are some that are exceedingly rare. And within the neuro-oncology branch, we're focusing on those tumors that have an incidence of less than two to 3,000 people per year diagnosed within a special effort that we call NCI Connect, in which we're trying to build networks, partner with advocacy and patients, to understand these diseases, both the impact on the person and developing new treatments for them. Well, Dr. Armstrong, just to go a little bit level level deeper, um, do do all of, do all of these rare CNS tumors have a standard of care that doctors uh, can deliver, or, or 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 do they not? Where where do things stand with in terms of um, standard treatment uh, protocols for these rare CNS tumors? That's a really, really important question, David. And unfortunately, some of these uh, tumor types do not have a standard of care because of the low incidence and that we haven't been able to do trials to identify what really helps the person in their survival. So part of our effort is to try to identify and understand that. And we're doing that um, through several of the projects within NCI Connect. What's in? Please. And if I could add um, that there are lots of challenges faced by patients who have a rare uh, cancer, uh, particularly those with the rare CNS tumors. Um, oftentimes there's a delay in diagnosis um, because the, the appearance under the microscope is unusual. Um, and again, 
with a delay in diagnosis is often a delay in, in initiating treatment. As Dr. Armstrong uh, mentioned, um, it is difficult to establish a standard of care if, in fact, we have difficulty assembling enough patients into a clinical trial to actually test it in a way that we can then use that uh, to establish what is the best practice and care for those patients. Additionally, the patients with these rare diseases um, feel like they're alone um, and can feel isolated. And oftentimes, their healthcare providers are not familiar with the disease. Um, and again, it leads to uncertainty and, and anxiety on, on the part of the patient. And one of the goals of the NCI Connect is to bring together patients and advocacy, uh, as well as a network of, of centers and investigators to improve the outcomes uh, for patients with these rare diseases. Dr. Gilbert, just could you expand uh, a little bit more in terms of what should, what should a patient or patients uh, think about asking if, they're, if they have one of these very rare brain tumor types to make sure that the institution or hospital they're going to has the kind of expertise in their area? Well, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, I would say that um, given the ability for the medical community to communicate, um, particularly with all of the, uh, the internet and other um, opportunities, that patients should ask their treating, uh, their healthcare providers, their level of expertise and knowledge. And if they get a sense that uh, it is not very high to really reach out to centers of excellence. In the, in the setting of rare CNS cancers, uh, we would welcome uh, inquiries from patients uh, with these diseases. And again, some of them will fit into the NCI Connect, but overall, um, I think we would be happy to, uh, to provide some consultation. And I think I would add to that, that um, those some simple questions that you can ask if you're diagnosed with a rare CNS tumor or really any central nervous system tumor when you seek out healthcare is how many of uh, uh, these types of tumors has that particular phys physician treated in the past and how many they've seen in the last year will give you an idea of their experience with that. You know, no one wants to see a physician who maybe says that they've only seen one of these tumors before. You may not feel comfortable with that. The other thing that's really important within that is to have a partner with you when you see a physician or ask these questions. It can be really overwhelming, and there's a lot of information that could be shared. But if you're able to have somebody with you at the appointment that can hear what you hear, that can take notes for you, sometimes then you can have that information and remember it after you've been um, given so much overwhelming information in a short period of time. So partnership with someone to help you look for that help and support and seek out experts and care are all really important points. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. And for those of you just joining us, we've talked about so far two major concepts. One is understand and know your tumor. What, what do you have? The importance of pathology, Dr. Gilbert underscored. And second, Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Gilbert talked about the importance of finding the right expertise for you, um, um, providers that really know your tumor type. And, and so now let's move to a, a third concept is, what are the new treatment approaches for uh, uh, CNS tumors, including rare CNS tumors? Uh, Dr. Gilbert. Yeah, so thanks, David. This is obviously critical and, and I would say very, very exciting. Um, as many people know, there have been tremendous advances in our ability to investigate cancers. Uh, we can do genetic analyses that would have been unheard of even five years ago to better understand the biology of the cancer and to start asking questions about specific treatments we consider these treatments targeted therapies. We like to imagine that they are personalized treatments based on the specific characteristics of the cancer. So the targeted therapies remain an area of active investigation. And what we're discovering is that many of these cancers, even though they fall under the same name, for example, glioblastoma, that they have individual differences. And it's through these types of genetic analyses that we're able to 
think about targeting specific aspects of the cancer. In order to do this, we need to have very large collaborative efforts, and I'm very, very pleased to tell everybody that the brain tumor research community is a very collaborative environment, and we have um, studies planned with colleagues, not only in North America, but also in Europe and Asia. And we're bringing all of that expertise together for the common purpose of making treatments better. We're not stopping with um, targeted therapies. Of course, everybody is interested in immunotherapy. This has been a fantastic advance in other cancers. Diseases that were previously incurable, they are now putting patients into long-term remission with immunotherapy. And we would like to, of course, see the same type of success in, in the brain tumor field. But we're also recognizing that it's more complicated treating brain tumors than other cancers. And so there are active investigations going on both in the laboratory as well as in clinical trials to better understand the immunotherapy. I'd probably add about immunotherapy. It's a, it's a concept that you may read about or hear about a lot, and it's really about harnessing the person's immune system to help battle the cancer. And that can be done either passively or actively. Passively by harnessing that immune system or actively by actively engaging your immune system. So it's really using a therapy to help your body fight the cancer. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a great explanation. And it, it will likely turn out that it won't be a single immunotherapy that works. It will have to be a combination of strategies uh, to overcome some of the difficulties in getting an immune reaction in, in the brain. I also want to talk about metabolomics. So we have discovered that cancer cells have a unique metabolism, and there are active studies trying to target that metabolism, again, looking for that Achilles heel in the cancer um, and having uh, the ability to specifically target cancer without causing much in the way of side effects. And of course, all of this means that we need to focus energy and have participation in clinical trials. So there are a large number of clinical trials available across the United States, uh, as well as Europe and, and Asia. But focusing in the United States, um, if people are interested in participating in clinical trials, and we can't encourage it enough, there are ways of finding out what's available. Ask your healthcare providers, um, cancertrials.gov, uh, as well as other um, uh, places to look uh, to, to be able to navigate to clinical trials. There's always the issue of paying for some clinical trials. Um, this has been a challenge. Uh, we are very pleased to say that the patients who participate in clinical trials uh, through the National Institutes of Health here at, at the NCI Bethesda campus, we were able to cover the cost of clinical trial as well as some of the, the transportation and lodging. So if you're interested in coming here, it's important to know that the initial screening costs wouldn't be covered, but if you're on a trial, the trial therapy is provided at no charge, and there's also support for travel and lodging um, for people who come here. And definitely that clinicaltrials.gov web website is a great resource for finding trials that are available around the country, particularly if you're interested in trials that may be closer to where you live. And then finally, I'd add there are different phases of trials. And there are um, from phase one, uh, which we're really looking at the efficacy of the treatment, phase two, where we're looking at to see if it has efficacy with the tumor, and then phase three to see if it's better than the standard treatment. And each phase of these trials are really important to the development of new therapies and advancing the care we can provide to patients. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Gilbert. Um, one question that often comes up is, is what are the different types of treatments uh, a patient needs to think about based on the grade of their tumor, uh, going from the lowest grade or benign tumors to the highest grade tumors. Do all brain tumors, patients of all grades, need to think about all of these different treatment modalities, or does that differ based on uh, the grade and type of tumor you have? So David, this is an excellent point, and there is no um, cookbook, as we say, uh, that covers all brain tumors. And so we need um, 
very important information, starting with the type of tumor. Um, second is the grade of tumor. And then third, um, as our knowledge is expanding, we are increasingly relying on genetic changes within specific tumors to help guide treatment. Um, this has been a very pivotal advance uh, in our way of approaching these cancers, recognizing that certain treatments work best for subtypes or within the, the individual cancers. As we continue our work and as the availability to genetic testing increases, we will be able to further refine the treatments. We recognize that um, the treatments have to be individualized um, and that within each uh, patient's treatment plan, factors such as their, um, their functional status um, and concurrent illness has to be incorporated into the decision-making process to optimize the therapy for each patient. So it's really important if you're somebody with a brain tumor or a loved one has a brain tumor that taking care of themselves in terms of being as active as they can, having the support they have from family or even therapists if that's needed, undergoing physical therapy if they have issues with weakness or speech are really important. And then finally, it's um, mm -hmm. circling back to what we talked about before um, in relation to the symptoms. It's not uncommon for patients to need other medications during their illness to manage those symptoms. Those include things like corticosteroids, a common one that's used as dexamethasone to control brain swelling. Oftentimes this is needed to reduce neurologic symptoms or headaches. And in those patients who have had seizures or are thought to be at heightened risk, they're also on anticonvulsants or anti-seizure medications. And knowing what medications you're on and what you can do to manage your symptoms is critically important. And keeping an open line of communication with your healthcare team about what symptoms you're having will make a difference in the therapies that are available to you and also your quality of life. Yeah, and I would add to that, it's very important that you tell your healthcare providers about all the medication you're taking, um, even some of the, the treatments that are considered alternative. That's very helpful. And, um, you know, it seems like what you're saying is there's the standard treatments and maybe you could enumerate what those are once again uh, for our audience, but then there's also the subject of alternative treatments. You're saying, uh, please talk to your medical providers, your care team about that. Um, uh, and just a reminder, in a few minutes we'll be taking questions. Please put your questions below, and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, before we pivot net to the next, the subject of research, let's um, reaffirm what are the, the just the, the major treatment modalities um, for brain tumor patients from low grade to high grade, uh, just so we, we know what those are as we move into um, research to improve those treatments? Dr. Gilbert? Sure, so the first step, sure, the first step is, is a surgical procedure. Um, for most of uh, the brain tumors that we deal with, the more extensive the removal of tumor, the better. Um, again, this needs to be done uh, with safety in mind. Um, so depending upon the location within the central nervous system, that will dictate um, how safe a resection can be. So there are areas of the brain that we call eloquent, uh, where functions such as speech, language, um, memory, we want to make sure that those are not compromised. Um, and importantly, that's true whether it's a low-grade or a high-grade tumor. So you talked about differences maybe based on that, but where the tumor is in the brain really determines the, the surgery even more than the grade of the tumor. That is correct. And so following the surgical procedure, uh, which is used both to help with the, the treatment and, as I mentioned before, for grade 1 tumors, a complete removal is often curative. Uh, for the other grade two, three, and four tumors, it is helpful to have an extensive resection. But it also very importantly provides us the tumor tissue to make the most accurate diagnosis. Following that, um, one of the, the foundations of treatment for most brain tumors that require additional treatment, there is radiation therapy. Radiation therapy has evolved greatly over the last three decades. 
There's tremendous precision um, in the delivery of radiation therapy, which maximizes the delivery to the tumor and minimizes the exposure of the surrounding brain uh, to the potential harm of the treatment. So we are very excited um, how much improvement there's been in radiation therapy. There are different modalities. Um, typically, it's um, external beam radiation therapy, but there are other modalities such as uh, focused radiation, uh, like radio surgery. This is often uh, either accompanied by or followed by some form of chemotherapy, and again, that is very much dependent upon the tumor type and the tumor grade. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. And, and we've, um, we've heard that some patients are wearing headsets um, uh, for another type of treatment delivery. Could right. you say a word about what that is? Sure. So thanks uh, for, for reminding me. Um, there is a device uh, that uh, provides uh, uh, fields, electromagnetic fields through the tumor, called tumor-treating fields. Um, it is the Novacure device, and recent studies uh, in patients who have new, with newly diagnosed glioblastoma uh, are indicating a survival improvement with the use of, of this device. So increasingly, patients are considering this as an adjunct to their surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And I think importantly what this highlights is that at each step um, in the process, a patient has a number of choices that they can make regarding their care, and they also have a number of uh, things that the clinician providing care need to consider, whether it's the extent of surgery, the type of radiation therapy, or the use of some standard treatments that are available. So any questions that people have, they, they need to talk to their healthcare professional about that so they can be informed and make the choice that is right for them. Thank you. And Dr. Armstrong, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree that while patients have choices, we would like for there to be more and better choices out there for patients. And that, that really brings in the subject of advancing research. Um, let's turn to research now and what we hope is next. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Armstrong, could you give us a sense of what's the future uh, hold for brain tumor research? Well, I think the future looks very promising. As I mentioned before, there is a level of international collaboration that is unprecedented. Um, everybody is recognizing that there needs to be a collective effort uh, to make advancement. And so the, the scale and scope uh, and sophistication of our clinical trials is increasing. Our integration of laboratory science into our clinical research, and just as importantly, the integration of patient outcomes measures into this research is giving us insights um, into what our clinical trials really mean and how to build on them in a way that's never been done before. So I'm very excited. Um, I'm excited about the fact that we are making inroads both at the genetic level to find targeted therapies, but also immunotherapy um, and looking at it in the way and using the techniques to study immunotherapy uh, that are really cutting edge and will hopefully lead to better understanding of immunotherapy for brain tumors, which will hopefully translate into much better treatments. Here at um, the Neuro-Oncology branch, we're doing a couple of things to try to really understand the impact of the disease on the person. And one of the things that we're exploring, particularly in rare tumors, is what makes one person more at risk than another. And this is a common question that patients come and ask us. So we have a web-based um, survey that we're doing with rare tumor patients in which we ask about exposures and family history, working with expert epidemiologists from around the country. We're obtaining uh, DNA to try to identify that. And within our natural history study, we're engaging with patients and following them throughout the course of their disease and asking them questions along the way about how they're doing and tying that into what we know about the tumor as well as the imaging so we can better identify areas that we can help to make patients' lives better. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's really appreciated. And um, it, it sounds like th there's so much exciting research happening, um, a, a lot of new doors being opened. And, but, uh, and that, that sets up um, how the NCI Connect is really 
also driving research forward. And the National Brain Tumor Society is excited to partner with the NCI on the NCI Connect project to advance research and help patients, particularly with these rare CNS tumors. Can you, can you share a little bit more information about that new and exciting endeavor? Yeah, absolutely. This is a program which we have had funded through the uh, Biden Cancer Initiative that we're really excited about. We've identified 12 tumor types that Dr. Gilbert will share with you that we're focusing on really understanding what is the risk for these tumors, what is the impact of these tumors, and then focused on developing treatments for patients with these tumors. And probably most importantly, um, we're, we are partnering directly with advocacy organizations and with patients, um, bringing us all together to the same table to try to understand the impact and work together to improve the lives of patients. So let me go through the, the tumor types that we have selected uh, for the beginning of the NCI Connect program. The hope is we, we will have opportunity to expand this uh, as time goes on. So the NCI Connect tumor types include atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, brainstem and midline glioma, choroid plexus tumors, ependymoma, gliomatosis cerebri, medulloblastoma, meningioma, oligodendroglioma, pineal region tumors, pleomorphic xanthroastrocytoma, supertentorial embryonal tumors, or PNETs, and primary CNS sarcoma, or secondary CNS sarcoma, also known as gliosarcoma. So Dr. Gilbert has read the list, and I think you all are able to see that list of tumor types. We also are, are sharing this through social media, through our hashtag NCI Connect, and through our Neuro Oncology um, branch website as well. Well, this is very exciting. This offers up uh, some really new research and participatory opportunities for rare these rare CNS patients to engage with the NCI to, to help advance research by providing their data, um, but also for patients to, to call the NCI Connect program and, and talk about their disease. And so um, just taking the oligodendroglioma community, 1,500 Americans alone get oligodendroglioma, and this is a great new opportunity to get involved in a, a way to work together with the NCI to advance research and, and get help at the same time. But of course, we want our audience uh, today to know that the neuro-oncology branch is, is, is even more than that and is uh, a, an outstanding place to go for a second, third, or even fourth opinion, depending on what a patient and their family is looking for. Uh, as said before, it's a free service, and it, it really is um, something that uh, few countries, and certainly not every cancer type, has a, a neuro, a, a branch devoted to their type of tumor the way we have for the neuro-oncology branch. So, so uh, for our audience, the NOB, as we affectionately call it, is a very special place uh, that is a great service to the brain tumor community. Let's pivot now to uh, our first viewer question for Dr. Armstrong and Dr. Gilbert. Um, not surprisingly about, about how, how brain tumors come into being. And so what progress has been made to understand the origin or of primary brain tumors. Basically, how did they get there in the first place? So that, that's a great question. Um, we are doing, I think, a very good job in understanding what the cell of origin is, so what cell within the, the central nervous system uh, has become malignant to form the cancer but we don't really understand in most patients why that happened. They are uncommon enough um, that uh, we, we don't have the types of links like lung cancer with smoking or, or other environmental exposure. Um, but um, you know, we, we certainly are investigating to see if there are particular um, patients who have some type of susceptibility and we're doing that uh, along with our colleagues in epidemiology. Yeah, I think I would add to that that um, the person who asked this question, you're not alone in this question. Probably one of the most common things that people ask us is, why did this happen to me? And also, what about my children? So 
you know, in general, we don't know in any individual why a tumor developed for them. Um, it's estimated that in less than 5% of all primary brain tumors, there's an inherited condition that led to it. So most patients do not have that issue. And it's only in those folks that we then um, consider or, or concerned about their children. So you're not alone in that question. And as Dr. Gilbert said, there's many people working hard to identify it, but there are very little um, risk factors that we have for the occurrence of uh, brain tumors and even less is known about the rare tumors and is the reason we're doing our work. Thank you. Uh, our next viewer question is, are there any immunotherapy treatments accessible for glioblastoma patients outside of clinical trials? So th this is a, a very important question, um, and I would say to date we do not have um, substantial evidence that immunotherapy treatments, at least in their current form, are effective. And so I would really encourage people to participate in clinical trials because that's where we will do the work to determine whether or not a, a treatment is effective. Some of the immunotherapies do have significant side effects, and in the absence of knowing that, it, that they work, I would be reluctant to encourage people to do things that have not been proven uh, outside the context of a clinical trial. And Dr. Gilbert, just to follow up on that, um, uh, what advice do you think um, patients and their families should consider or, or even ask themselves or ask their providers to, to assess their uh, sense of uh, risk benefit in deciding whether or not to enter into a clinical trial? So that, that is a great question. Uh, and I think that's a very important discussion to have with your physician before you make a decision to participate in a clinical trial. Clinical trials are very, very carefully reviewed and vetted um, so that we know that we take all possible measures to make them as safe as possible um, and to make sure that when we complete the clinical trial, we have answered an important question about that particular treatment. So I encourage people to consider clinical trials um, and to realize that uh, that is the way we will advance our knowledge and ultimately uh, develop and discover new and, and effective treatments. Uh, so again, the, the safety concerns uh, are all being carefully monitored um, and it's an important way to advance knowledge. There's some really practical questions that people may want to consider, and I know the NCI as well as the MBTS and other groups have a wonderful list of questions that may help you when you visit with your clinician and physician and ask them about that. Simple things like how often do I need to come to the hospital and what other medications may I have to take and how long does this treatment last? How often will MRIs be reviewed? Understanding the logistics of the treatment oftentimes can help you be prepared for what you need to do in the future and help you um, be able to tolerate the treatment as you know what to expect as you go forward on a clinical trial. Thank you. That's very helpful uh, information. Our next viewer question is, why are some brain tumors inoperable while others are operable? So, um, it's a, it's a great question, and again, um, everything in, in medicine, and particularly in, in considering a surgical procedure, is a balance of risk and benefit. And so depending upon the location of the tumor within the central nervous system really does depend how operable it is. So tumors that are deep in the brain um, are difficult to get to, and um, a lot of the neurologic function is, is in a very confined space. So there's a, a higher risk of causing neurologic harm by the deep-seated tumors. Again, other areas in the bigger part of the brain, the cerebrum, some areas are actually uh, quite uh, amenable to surgery. So uh, what we do know is areas like the frontal lobes um, are particularly amenable to surgery because there's a lot of uh, duplication of function between the right and left frontal lobe. So it's possible for a neurosurgeon to remove quite a bit without harm 
whereas other areas, as I mentioned before, are eloquent and there is functions that would be at risk if too extensive of a surgical procedure are done. I think I would add to that that if the tumor is in more than one area of the brain, sometimes that makes the risk of the surgery outweigh the benefit. Or if you have other medical conditions that may make the surgeon concerned about putting you under anesthesia or the recovery time, sometimes that can also affect whether a, a tumor is operable. But if, if you're told that your tumor is inoperable, those are important questions for you to ask so you understand what was uh, used to make that decision. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how can patients help to advocate for best practices or uh, the right practices perhaps for them in the surgical and neuro-oncology neuro environment? So, you know, I think there are a number of ways that that can happen. Um, you really need to be an advocate for yourself or have somebody designated within your family who can be that advocate as well. Um, it's really a, a two-way um, conversation with your healthcare provider as well. You need to be able to have your questions um, answered in a way that you understand, but you also need to be able to you know you need to share information with your provider. Um, so communication is really the key to advancing um, care uh, provided by neuro-oncology healthcare professionals. And the other thing I would add to that would be to really consider um, a second opinion um, and to make sure that before you make an important decision about a treatment that you are comfortable with that decision. Um, and many of us in the field um, are very comfortable uh, with patients seeking a second opinion and we really encourage it so that, that when a decision is made, it is a decision that everybody uh, feels was the right decision at the time. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. And just to say, emphasize what you're just saying, uh, we hear from a lot of patients uh, that they worry about hurting their doctor's feelings if they go get a second opinion. And could you um, speak to that just a little bit more so we can really get this straight? That's a great question and very pragmatic. Um, as a doctor, um, I would strongly encourage, again, the use of, of second opinion. The physicians that I interact with on a routine basis all feel very strongly that patients need to feel comfortable with their decision. Um, we have different opinions um, and different approaches to the treatment of these diseases and to hear um, other approaches and other philosophies of treatment is very helpful um, in recognizing that which we can say resonates uh, with the patient. And so um, I don't think that that's an issue. Um, I would again um, make a strong uh, recommendation for that opinion or and you can have a third opinion, but again, you need to balance the number of opinions with the time frame. So you don't want to waste too much time seeking opinions. Get some opinions, make a decision. Thank you. And I would just um, add. I would just add to that. Sorry, David. Um, and that you know there are certain points that it's good to think about getting a second opinion when the tumor is first diagnosed, or if there is recurrence, and you're thinking about other treatment options. That's a really good time to seek a second opinion. You know, if you're you're doing well and on a therapy. Sometimes the benefit to you of that second opinion may not be as great as if you're at a point where you need to make a decision about it. And then we always contact the referring physician and make direct personal contact with them to let them know what our thoughts were and partner with them. And I would encourage you to ask if you're at a second opinion for that to happen so you know that there is communication again between the providers. Thank you. And I'm assuming you you would also encourage second opinions on the at the surgical level as well, or is that different? So that um, we would, um, and we would encourage patients to uh, consider uh, seeking out uh, a neurosurgeon who is an expert in brain tumor neurosurgery. On rare occasions, um, the need for surgery is quite urgent, but in most instances, uh, there is time 
to consider uh, alternative uh, surgeons. Oftentimes, patients with symptoms wind up in a community hospital emergency room, um, and if they had a few days to seek out other opinion, um, they hopefully would get to a center of excellence where the neurosurgeons have true expertise in, in doing the neurosurgical procedure. Thank you. Our next viewer question is, is glioblastoma with a high mutation burden, um, a, uh, and uh, in this question, uh, the number 320 is here, uh, a rare CNS tumor? Are there experts who treat patients with such kinds of glioblastoma? So um, is it a rare CNS tumor? I think the answer to that um, is that we are increasingly um, doing genetic testing on glioblastoma, both at the time of diagnosis and at recurrence. And we're finding that the mutational burden in many of these cancers increases um, over time with treatment. Um, and so we don't know whether or not it's truly rare. We suspect that it will be increasingly recognized. Um, and I would say that with that increased recognition that experts in the field, neuro-oncologists, will be working to develop therapies specifically for patients with what we call hypermutated malignant glioma. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Um, our final question, our final viewer question, is at what point in treatment is it appropriate to consider a clinical trial? And, and I would just add, if you could also answer that question also in light of these uh, different grades or different uh, grades of tumors that we talked about earlier. We would really encourage people to think about clinical trials at all phases of the disease from the time of diagnosis mm -hmm. through recurrence. You know, clinical trials um, are um, oftentimes changing. There are new trials opening all the time. Um, so we can't say today with the trials that will be available in six months. However, we do know that by the use of clinical trials, we'll be evaluating new therapies and advancing the care, hopefully for that individual person and also for all patients with brain tumors. So it's important um, at those important points in your disease to think about if there is a clinical trial that's available to you and that meets what you want for your care um, and your particular disease. Right, and, and again, I would reiterate that these clinical trials have been carefully reviewed um, and in the decision-making process as the patient, as the patient's family, think about what the goal of the trial is and if that is something you want to participate in and help advance our knowledge, um, then uh, we encourage you uh, to do so. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Gilbert. Um, thank you, doctors. That's all the time we have today for questions. Um, I want to thank you both for spending time with us and time with uh, the brain tumor community. Um, uh, for our viewers, we've learned a lot here today. We've learned about the importance of knowing your tumor and that there are many different types of tumors, some of which are, can be extremely rare, but even those rare tumors are getting more and more attention thanks to programs like the NCI Connect. We also learned about today's standard treatment options uh, ranging from surgery all the way through radiation, uh, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and even devices. We also uh, learned a bit about where research is headed, particularly in the area of immuno-oncology and in other areas and the importance of that. And we've talked about the, uh, the criticality of clinical trials to, to patients and to advancing research. Uh, we've done a lot here today. Um, it seems like also we've learned about how to, we can take advantage of and uh, utilize the neuro-oncology branch of the NCI that is so important. And before we close, we'll ask Dr. Gilbert Dr. Armstrong to say a bit more about the NOB. Uh, but again, thank you both for spending time with us. And uh, before we uh, move forward, Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Armstrong, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we go? Well, I would like to first thank you very much, David, uh, for working with us on this fantastic program. Uh, you've done a stellar job. Um, 
in hosting. Um, we greatly appreciate your, um, your, your work, um, not only here, but your work with the MBTS. I would like to thank all the participants um, who have uh, joined into this Facebook Live event, and I would like to thank all of the patients and the care providers uh, who really partner with us, those who are in the field, um, who are working to make better treatments. We cannot thank you enough for your confidence in us and your support of us as we try to navigate better treatments um, in the future. Yeah, I would just echo my thanks. This has been an amazing opportunity. Thank you, David, for working with us. It's always fantastic to work with you. And it's it's really that partnership. And by partnering with patients and advocacy groups and providers like Dr. Gilbert and myself, that we can hopefully make a difference because none of us can do this by ourselves. Well, thank you. The feeling is mutual. I would like to remind viewers that this video will appear on both the National Cancer Institute Facebook page and on the NCI's YouTube channel. Any questions in the comments that we did not get to today will be answered shortly. To find out more about the trials mentioned today or to ask questions on brain tumors, please visit the NCI's contact center 1-800-4-CANCER or by email and live chat on cancer.gov. You can find other cancer clinical trials at trials.cancer.gov Thank you all for tuning in to the latest social media event hosted by the National Cancer Institute. Thank you again to the leadership of the Neuro-Oncology Branch. Very much appreciate the time of Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Armstrong on behalf of the brain tumor community. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thank you. Bye-bye. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, Cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER, produced May 2018.